Honestly, guys, you had two years to get yourself healthy, to get yourself screened, to do your blood work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You've had two years. There's no excuse anymore. I don't know what to say anymore, guys, besides rest in peace, Cedric McMillan. There's no autopsy report yet. The rumors are that he died of a heart attack, which doesn't surprise me because that seems to be the most common cause of death in bodybuilding nowadays. And especially over the last two years, we've lost a lot of competitive and non-competitive bodybuilders to heart attacks. Is that the pandemic? Is that the vaccines? Is that poor choices of drugs? Or poor habits regarding the lifestyle, I think they all contribute. And when you look back the last 20 or 30 years, when more of these cases became documented, the heart attack cases, I think it's pretty safe to say that heart attacks are the most common cause of death in bodybuilders, right? They're acute. If you have kidney issues or liver issues or other organ stress, in many cases, you can extend your life with proper medical treatment. But with a heart attack, um that in many cases that's very very deadly now i don't want to make this video about how great cedric mcmillan was how inspiring he was I, i'm sure we can all agree on this instead i want to make this video about a exercise of what you have learned over the last two years regarding heart health i've put out many videos about heart health over the last two years alone and so have many other educators in this bodybuilding space now it might be too late to save particular individuals who are already having heart issues, are not very proactive, I'm not talking about Cedric McMillan here, I'm just talking about the fitness industry in general. Not everybody is as proactive regarding their heart or organ imaging. Not everybody is proactive regarding the mitigation of side effects or removing particular performance enhancing drugs from their stack. I want to hear from you guys what you have learned over the last two years. Are you done? Okay, good. Now let's go over the checklist and discuss things that I've learned over the last 20 years to keep my heart healthy. Are you doing your daily fasted cardio, whether that's 20 minutes, 30 minutes, medium intensity, alternating intensities, whatever machine of cardio you have at your disposal. I don't care if it's walking outside at a brisk pace to the point you're sweating a little bit, but you can still hold a conversation. Are you doing that every day or at least five times a week? Right? It has a huge benefit for heart health. A couple of years ago, I had severe arrhythmias during the day. I was training too hard. I was going to the gym every day, almost five times a week, six days a week, taking a multitude of sets to failure, sometimes drop sets or triple drop sets. I love to work out, but my heart couldn't take it. So I would sit at my desk and suffer an arrhythmia. My heart would stop and pick back up at an accelerated rate. I was scared to death, literally. I would check my veins here in my neck, not feel my heartbeat, have a micro panic attack, and then my heart would pick back up because I was taking too many sets to failure and I was not doing my daily fasted cardio, nor was I paying special attention to my supplementation or my micronutrient intake. I've made a lot of videos about that on this YouTube channel. Feel free to give it a search, right? So you can extend your knowledge base about heart health if you're falling short on the things we'll discuss in this video. I went to the hospital. I did a 48 hour Holter monitor and saw that these arrhythmias were occurring during my workout multiple times because again, I was taking too many sets to failure. My heart would stop and after the working set, it would pick back up of the beats that it missed while I was putting a tremendous amount of strain on my heart. This was very, very scary, but I addressed it almost immediately within a couple days of this happening a multitude of times per day. I've learned since then, right? I spent the money, I did all of my imaging. So I adjusted my training intensity and started doing daily fasted cardio, 20 minutes to 30 minutes per day to keep my heart rate steady and stable at around 135 to sometimes 140 beats per minute. I prefer the elliptical, maybe you prefer the treadmill or the Stairmaster. Whatever you can do to do daily fasted cardio will already prevent a lot of the negative heart remodeling potentially these arrhythmias, which completely were resolved by doing daily fasted cardio, which I've been doing for the last couple of years. Yes, it's annoying. Yes, it takes a lot of time, but there's so much content on YouTube that you can kill time while doing cardio. Are you supplementing with taurine? 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 milligrams per day. Personally, I never noticed a difference between 5,000 and 10,000 milligrams taurine per day, but some guys are so severely taurine deficient, and you can easily tell from your lower back pumps, 
whether you're drug free or enhanced. If you have lower back pumps, you're probably taurine deficient. So you hop on an extensive protocol, maybe 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams taurine with meals, or you take 1,000 milligrams taurine with meals and 5,000 milligrams of taurine around the workouts. Because, well, the heart consists of a lot of taurine. So needless to say, when you're bodybuilding and you're putting a lot of strain in your heart, you need to supplement with taurine. Now, back in the day, we all knew about this because on the message boards, the steroid forums, if you were to go on clenbuterol, you would need to supplement taurine. But you can actually supplement taurine year-round. I put it in my year-round supplement stack. I've been supplementing with taurine for almost a decade now, and that already improved my heart health and exercise performance tremendously, right? I no longer have these arrhythmias that I suffered from a couple of years ago, which were still present when I was supplementing with taurine, but went away when I started doing daily fasted cardio and added in the ubiquino, which everybody should be running year round as well. And I'm not talking about 100 milligrams of coenzyme Q10, which results in about one quarter ubiquinol after it's converted in the body. 100 milligrams coenzyme Q10 converts to approximately 25 milligrams ubiquinol. I'm talking about 400 milligrams ubiquinol per day. So for that, you would need 1600 milligrams coenzyme Q10. Yes, it's expensive. I'm well aware of that. But you want to bodybuild. You want to train hard. You want to put a lot of stress on your heart in a time where bodybuilders are dying from heart attacks left and right. So that means you're going to supplement ubiquinol extensively. And I don't care how expensive it is. You're going to run it a lot, multiple times per day. 100 milligrams ubiquinol in the morning and 100 milligrams ubiquinol in the evening. And perhaps 100, 200, maybe even 300 milligrams ubiquinol before the workout. Every time you put a lot of strain on your heart, ubiquinol, taurine, hydration, something to keep your blood pressure in range. And whether that's cardotone or beetroot extract or Cialis or an angiotensin receptor blocker like Telmersartan, right? It really depends on how you need to manage your blood pressure alongside of the other performance enhancing drugs that you're taking. And if you're drug free, okay, you don't have to worry about that, but you still need the taurine, you still need the ubiquinol, and you still need to manage your electrolyte intake because the heart functions on magnesium, calcium, potassium, and sodium, and they need to be balanced accordingly. Now, if you're on nebivalol and telmosartan, you're complicating this matter further. So you're controlling your heart rate with nebivalol, which is a good thing. It has a positive heart remodeling effect. But when I compare my ultrasound before and after this last cycle, even though I was running nebivalol and even though I was running telmosartan, I still got left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, Part of that is because I'm training hard and I'm using performance enhancing drugs. And just like skeletal muscle has muscle memory, I'm pretty sure that the heart cardiac muscle also has muscle memory. So how much of that left ventricular hypertrophy was restored from cycles I did in my younger years at much higher dosages? Well, I don't have the evidence to support it because my first ultrasound that I did a couple of years back, unfortunately, I don't have those results in front of me. But I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure, guys, and if I'm mistaken, I'm honestly sorry, but I'm pretty sure a lot of the left ventricular hypertrophy that I got over the last cycle was actually already there, but because I came off cycle for nine months and only did cardio while continuing with nebivalol and telomosartan, um, I was able to remodel my heart in a better sense. And then some of that negative heart remodeling resulting in left ventricular hypertrophy simply returned. Now, I got a little bit off topic there. My initial point is that if you're running nebivalol and telmosartan preventatively, you need to adjust your micronutrient intake, particularly your potassium intake. Because combining both of these compounds by themselves, they already have indications of hyperkalemia, but combining them, you're increasing this risk of hyperkalemia. If you're taking a bivalol and telmosartan together or other compounds which are known to induce hyperkalemia, even if it's only in very small instances, and you're doing this during a carb loading scenario for a contest or a photo shoot, you're increasing your potassium intake, whether that's through potassium salt, potassium supplements, or high potassium foods, and then you combine that with a potassium sparing diuretic, quite deadly, quite deadly. 
Yeah, cardiac events left and right, besides the cramping which will occur before the cardiac event. And while we're on the subject, also keep in mind that through sweating, you predominantly lose sodium. So if you're on a bivalent, telmosartan and potassium salt or potassium-rich foods, and you're not managing your sodium intake correctly, in the two hours, three hours that you're at the gym, and you top that off with a sauna or post-workout cardio in a jumpsuit, for example, you're also losing a ton of sodium, resulting potentially in a heart attack or a cardiac event. You got to be super, super careful, guys. Everything that we do to our bodies has risk. And our hearts are probably more compromised now. We're already compromising our heart ourselves more than enough. The sleep apnea compromises your heart health. The high blood pressure compromises your heart health. High body weight, anything over a body mass index of 30 compromises your heart health. Now, I know what you guys are going to say. That's only relevant to people who are obese. Body mass index over 30, especially 35, 40. I mean, it's almost a death sentence. Just keep in mind that fat is not as metabolically active as skeletal muscle. And even though you're highly athletic and don't carry around so much body fat, just keep in mind that this increased amount of skeletal muscle that you have puts more strain or more demand on your heart. Whether that's an oxygen demand or a nutrient demand or a removal of metabolic waste product demand, your heart has to pump harder and perhaps faster, right? Having a higher resting heart rate, even if you're taking a beta blocker. Now, good thing is, fasted cardio can mitigate some of these effects. Training your heart to accommodate, acclimatize to this increased body weight that you have. Now, that being said, most bodybuilders would not consider themselves to be bodybuilders with a body mass index below 30. Even though general population would be considered obese with a BMI over 30, Bodybuilding kind of starts with the BMI over 30. Take myself as an example. I still consider myself a bodybuilder, even though I've been off cycle for eight weeks or so, slowly getting weaker, slowly getting less impressively looking, but still representing somewhat of a bodybuilder look. My body mass index is about 31.7. I'm 175 centimeters tall, 5'9", I believe, at 97 kilograms. So if I wanted to bring my body mass index below 30, I would have to bring my weight down or get taller somehow. Um, my weight need to come down to 92 kilos, which is not even 200 pounds, I believe. I'll put it down below on the screen because I don't know these conversions off the top of my head. I've been 118 kilos, 255 pounds in the past with the same height, obviously, with a body mass index of, what is it, 38? That's very risky. And yes, guys, I'm well aware that this body mass index is highly controversial and might not be completely applicable to bodybuilders. People are generally fit. Still, the evidence is there. We can learn from it. We can take it as a guideline. Anything over 35, I would say, is putting yourself at risk. And even though that risk is mostly determined on general population who are obese, right? Legitimately fat with a body mass index over 30 or 35, or a lot of body fat, hypertension, poor lipid levels, poor cardiovascular endurance. The evidence is there. Maybe we can take it as a guideline. Ideally, we all bring our body mass index down below 35. I certainly feel better below 35. And the closer I get to 30, the healthier, the more athletic, more endurance, better performance in the gym, right? Albeit not strength-wise, but certainly from a cardiovascular endurance-wise. The closer I get to a body mass index of 30, the better my cardiovascular system feels. Now, are you doing the same thing? Are you doing your MRIs? Are you doing your EKGs or ultrasounds or 48-hour Holter monitors? If you have a heart issue, do address that right away. I'm still waiting for my CT scan. As soon as I have the go-ahead from the kidney doctor, because he advised me to check my kidneys to see if my kidneys were up for this radioactive iodine, which I need to take for a CT scan. As soon as I get the green light from that, doing an ultrasound on my kidney, a 24-hour urine collection test with inulin clearance and then determine my glomerular filtration rate based on cystat and C in serum and within urine collected over 24 hours, calculate it to the inulin clearance over 24 hours and then see what my calculated glomerular filtration rate and my kidney function actually is. Not this estimated GFR based on serum creatinine and not even measuring the creatinine within urine, right? This cookie cutter eGFR 
that the doctors like to shove under your nose. We're a little bit smarter than that. So after I get those results, and I'm pretty confident that I will get the green lights to move ahead to a CT scan with contrasts, then I can determine my heart health with that imaging tool. Right? Besides the MRIs and the ultrasounds and the EKGs and the 48-hour Holter monitors, which I've done in the past a multitude of times now, this is basically the last test that I can do to determine my calcium score, see if there's any obstruction within the coronary arteries, if I need to become even more proactive going forward. I know it's highly expensive, but this is a mandatory when you start taking performance enhancing drugs. And if you have cardiovascular disease in your family, it's basically mandatory. And I know that some of the cardiologists are going to say, no, it's not necessary. You're still young. You're below 50 years old. You don't have any um, noticeable effects regarding your uh, cardiovascular health, right? You don't have any chest pain or numbness in the left arm, no um, edema around the ankles, all these things you usually check every time I go to the cardiologist. And trust me, I've been many, many times, way more than necessary probably, but I like to be proactive about this shit because I am putting a lot of strain on my body with this exercise and the performance enhancing drugs that I've taken in the past and, well, still taking in the future. So I am more proactive. I am a lot more proactive over the last two years because, again, heart attacks are more common nowadays in the situation, the global pandemic that we're living in. And besides all of the organ imaging that you can do, you can do a lot of preventative screening through blood work, clotting factors, factor V Leiden, fibrinogen levels. You can check your D-dimer levels frequently just to see if you have underlying symptoms of COVID that you might not determine because a little bit of cough or a little bit of a sniffle is all that you're noticing. You think it's a common cold, but underlying you actually have COVID, the symptoms are just not very, very bad. You can determine that with a white blood cell differential, white blood cell count, D-dimer levels. I check them every month just to make sure that I didn't catch COVID unknowingly and transmit that to other people in my immediate surroundings. I've checked my fibrinogen levels, my clotting factors. Man, I've done so much screening over the last two years. Because honestly, dude, there's no excuse. Yes, it's expensive. But you can choose to spend your money or not spend your money on other luxuries. This is actually keeping you alive. You don't need the alcohol or the expensive cars or the video games. You can spend all of that money on preventative screening. And let's be fucking honest. If you have money for performance enhancing drugs, you should also have money for the preventative screening. You are ultimately in control of what you do with your body. You can't control the pandemic. You can't control vaccine mandates. But what you can control is what you put in your body performance enhancing drug wise. You can control how much cardio you're doing. You can control your body weight. You can control your body mass index. So even though it seems that everything is against us, it is not healthy what we do. And we are putting ourselves more at risk, especially during these times. And in the only way to combat that is to be extremely proactive. Honestly, guys, you had two years to get yourself healthy, to get yourself screened, to do your blood work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You've had two years. There's no excuse anymore. And I know this is a lot of preaching and it might go over your head completely. You don't really care. You don't really want to listen to me. That's fine. Maybe I'll die from a heart attack in the near future too. And my wife will be the first one to tell everybody that I obviously didn't do enough to keep myself healthy, right? So hopefully you guys will never hear that news. I will die of old age, just like I hope everybody else watching this video and everybody in the bodybuilding community will die of old age and not due to a heart attack, which is partially all self-induced, right? You don't have to be a bodybuilder. You don't have to take all of these drugs. You don't have to not do cardio or not do your organ imaging or your blood work and all of the preventative measures which are out there at our disposal. Well, I think that's enough preaching for today. So let's close off this video on a lighter note. A front double bicep for the vigorous crew. You guys know what to do. A very light front double bicep. But well, let's be honest, not so impressive bodybuilding is healthier bodybuilding. You know it's true. You know it's true. I'll see you guys in the next video.